A warm welcome to the session on Catalyzing Finance, Accelerating the Indo-Pacific Energy Transition, organized by the Sustainable Finance and the Indo-Pacific, uh, it is the SOFIP Development Network, which is the joint initiative of the AFD and the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, now, this is a virtual side event under the banner of the Think20 Brazil, which is the think tank engagement group of uh, the G20. Now, SUFIP DN, uh, uh, that is the SUFIP Development Network, uh, its objective is to foster cooperation and exchange uh, of knowledge to respond to some of the critical development challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. So uh, eventually, uh, what, what we find out that there are three very clear verticals of intervention, and these are uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, energy transition, and global health systems and resilience. So as one can make out uh, that this webinar has to do with energy transition financing, which again has implications for mitigation endeavors. Now, now as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, uh, uh, which is at the epicenter of climate change, the region faces significant environmental challenges, which is also, also compounded uh, uh, by its heavy reliance on fossil fuels. Now, this dependence, while fueling economic growth and, and, and poverty reduction has also led to the region emitting uh, around 17 billion, to be precise, uh, to the tune of 16.75 billion tons of CO2 annually. Now, as the region consumes a quarter of the global energy, a figure which is projected to approach half by 2050, shifting to affordable clean energy is crucial for uh, both uh, the economic stability and achieving the SDGs. Now, achieving or, or, or addressing the shifts is, is essential for sustaining growth, and financing this transition is the key. Now, uh, encouragingly, the region has also seen a surge in renewable energy investment, and at the same time, a sharp decline, in fact, in solar and battery storage costs. So it's, it's important to explore how specific countries or sectors might benefit from these trends and how finance can drive impactful change. Uh, if if we also look at the past uh, G20 summits, especially the last two, uh, namely Indonesia and India, they have emphasized on the need for to reform the international financial systems, particularly the multilateral development banks, to reduce uh, uh, green, uh, green investment costs in developing economies. In fact, even even in the in, in the in the Brazil uh, Think 20, there is. Uh, a vertical on reforming the international financial architecture, that is the task force three. The upcoming Brazil uh, G20 uh, summit has the opportunity to put the multilateral development banks and the MFIs and the DFIs to honor their commitment of scaling up the financing to around USD 100 billion, which is crucial for an inclusive energy transition. So given this precedence and given the fact that USD four trillion dollar of, of of annual investment is needed by 2030 for clean energy adoption, especially in the developing nations. The question is, what should be the financing strategies for an inclusive and equitable energy transition in this region? What innovative financing solutions can support climate action, particularly for the developing nations and in general for the global south? So these are the two overarching questions for today. The insights that we generate will, of course, inform the T20 Task Force 2's work on sustainable climate action and inclusive energy transitions, as also the Task Force 3, which is related to uh, the international financial architecture. So to deliberate further on this, we have today a galaxy of speakers. And uh, let me introduce Shubha Raha, fellow and lead international cooperation, uh, Council for Energy, Environment and Water, one of the most cherished institutions working in the domain of natural resources, energy and environment. Esther Tamara, uh, who is a fellow, in fact, at the FTCI, the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. Uh, Neha Kumar, who heads the South Asia, uh, heads South Asia at the Climate, Climate Bonds Initiative. Kedar Savant, who is the Senior Portfolio Manager uh, at the AFD, primarily looking at energy transition and water. And Giovanni Morris Pradipta, who is a policy advisor, uh, German-Indonesian Civil Society Dialogues at the German Watch. Now, before I come to the speakers for their intervention, let me request them to confine their initial interventions, initial presentation uh, within seven to eight minutes. 
uh, I might need to interject if it exceeds that as time is of essence to us because we would like to have a second round with all of you based on your first round intervention. So let me first come to Shubha Raha for uh, her deliberation. And especially, in fact, uh, my question to uh, uh, Shubha would, would be that how do you think that the PPP model and international cooperation can work to attract investment in renewable energy? And do we really have any replicable successful cases uh, which can be used or which can be replicated or models can be replicated, in fact, in this part of the world at, at, a, at a more macro scale? So over to you, Shubha. Thank you, Nilanja, and good morning, everyone. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm, uh, in fact, I have had close interactions with most of my co-panelists on this topic as well. So I'm expecting an escalating conversation here. So going first, I want to set the context a little bit, if you will, Nilanjan, uh, on where we are going with this. And because you said macro, I don't want to get into finance right off the bat over here. One of the early reports that we had done, in fact, with AFD and Kedar is over here, was on uh, financing this energy in the, in the Indo-Pacific itself. But we started with defining the Indo-Pacific. And if you go to see in geographical terms, it's a very vast area. It actually goes all the way from the um, sort of the Pacific islands on the eastern side to Kenya and such in Africa. So the spread when we say Indo-Pacific is not what we normally think of South Asia, Southeast Asia, that cluster. And the second thing, so we had looked at six very diverse countries to look at the definition of this, which is Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Singapore, and Vietnam, which are geopolitically different, they're economically different, their energy transition pathways, their natural capital, their societal models are all different. So one important thing that we should right off the bat not do is kind of have a one size fits all conversation on Indo-Pacific because there are very, very different countries in there. So um, in fact, that has led to a deeper study we're doing now on what is the global South. And we've started now looking at 40 countries across the world that are clus clustered as global South and how they completely behave differently. Now, the second point that I would like to touch on is that once you, identify that these are a heterogeneous bunch of countries. They're not homogeneous. It's not like the EU, which is a common economic zone. They have nothing in tying them to each other except for certain multilateral strategic alliances or partnerships or coalitions, if you will. So each of the energy transition and energy priorities differ, but their economic priorities also differ. I and mean, we have to understand that in terms of whether we're going in with a renewable energy focus or an energy transition focus, which is quite different from a renewable energy growth trajectory. The third point I will, and I'll expand a little bit on this uh, after I make the four points. The third thing that we saw, and this is when we were doing the G20 studies last year, when we were advising India Sustainable Finance Working Group and the Framework Working Group, which was looking at the macroeconomic pathways to sustainability, was that a lot of the financing requirements are not defined. You know, so when you are saying 4.3 trillion and a similar number is 4.3 billion, which is a population of the so-called Indo-Pacific, many of these countries have not defined their climate finance or sustainable finance or even renewable energy uh, financing requirements that can be taken to the multilateral or any other financing platform. So it's very ad hoc. So this is, again, um, numbers that we're getting from our modeling, but actually what's happening in the ground at an individual country's working capital level is very, very different. And that's where the finance is not flowing. And the fourth thing that I'll just speak about is the risk profile and measuring of each of these countries, right? Because the instruments that the multilaterals are working with, and let's say we look at standard Fitch or Moody's or S&P ratings, these are opaque, these are subjective, these are taking into account not only actual risks, but also perceived risks. It's taking into account parameters that are not related to directly to financial transactions. So we are not looking at NPAs or paying capacity. We're looking at human rights and freedom of press and all of those things as well. So we need to bring that portion back into the financial sphere of things. So these are the four points. Let me just make a little bit more, uh, explain a little bit more of each because Nilanjan asked for a couple of examples. So when we went deeper into each country, um, trying to see 
a Bangladesh versus an India and we're neighboring countries and everybody knows what's happening in Bangladesh right now and that happened quite overnight. So those sort of risks exist as well, political risks as we call them. But many countries do not have an elaborate energy transition strategy. So they may have near-term targets, they may have sectoral targets, but a cohesive energy transition strategy or a long-term strategy, the LTS or the NDCs, this do not have coherence from start to let's say anything for the next 25, 30 years. And that is a window in which investment happens from industry or CapEx and so on and so forth. So there is a large discrepancy in between where we are today, where the foresight is for the next 25, 30 years, where we see these countries in terms of where they see themselves, not even us seeing them, and therefore working the capital backwards. The second thing also very important, and this was touched upon by Nilanjan, is the dependence on fossil fuels, but also the revenue a lot of these Indo-Pacific countries get from fossil fuels. So when you replace fossil fuels, it is not just energy transition, it's economic replacement. So if you are not going to be selling gas for Bangladesh, for example, or if you don't want to sell um, the oil and gas of some of the Southeast Asian countries, then what is going to fill your economic void? And that is something that can prevent a transition from happening, not because technologies for transition or financing is not available, but other priorities are not being met. Uh, we always know that the technology is clustered, but more importantly, resources are also clustered. So again, saying that Bangladesh can do the same kind of solar that India does, that's not true. They don't have the land. They don't have um, the kind of uh, um, the solar uh, exposure that we are looking at. So it's, uh, the, or if you look at offshore wind, how many people have the exact same offshore wind footprint? So technology and resources, again, need to be very, very customized, mapped to each country. Um, and the fourth thing is also that these countries do not operate in vacuum. So what are the global value chains? Who are their allied countries? Where are they sourcing, let's say, their critical minerals from? Where would they get stuck if they went down a certain transition pathway? So these are the risks of transition that are non-financial, but actually eventually play into your lending mechanisms as well. India itself has four types of energy transitions going on right now. So we see a transition from traditional to modern source of energy. So we have on one hand burning cow dung cakes and uh, biomass uh, going to nuclear uh, that was scaling up right now, solar or whatever. We also have migration from rural to urban. So that also changes the energy behavior of people. We have going from growth to sustainable growth. So India is going to be the first major economy to grow on a low carbon pathway. We've just started our development journey and yesterday was Independence Day. And we will hope to be developed by 2047. Also developed is not defined. So another taxonomic issue there. And we're also integrating now with the global energy market. So we know the Russia story, the Russia oil, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows all these things. But all of these things play into the energy basket of each country. The final point that I want to make is when we're actually going into the financing. So there's a very narrow focus on mitigation, very narrow focus on adaptation. No one is talking infrastructure resilience, climate resilience, broader governance funds, economic transaction funds. So if we focus very narrowly on small, small projects right now, we are not going to have the disruptive growth that we need to have. We cannot scale up. It's like project level activity. And to do that, we really need to look at the credit rating of these companies, of these countries. So um, we had proposed uh, in 2016 with CEW, I was in CI at the point of time, it was an industry activity, the common risk mitigation me mechanism, which was taken up by the ISA. We tried to see if ISA could get funding at scale into certain regional uh, the clustering of countries. So these options exist. I'm going to close by saying that, you know, everybody knows money's stuck in the global north, money is not flowing. What is the ratio of MDB finance to sovereign finance to private sector capital? We know we need to unlock private sector. I, I would really like us to today kind of go a little bit deeper into where these opportunities exist for us to unlock these. Looking at each country or even a bucket of similar countries that will behave similarly, have similar supply chains or a part of a coalition and how do we sort of make sure that their transition is unified rather than just saying, okay, how does how do we get some X amount of money into something called the Indo-Pacific? Thanks, Nilanjan. No, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shubha. I think uh, extremely vital points. Uh, undoubtedly, if, if we talk about Indo-Pacific as this 
huge uh, space as such. We cannot have one size fits all, and that cannot work. And you talked about a host of uh, risks that are going to emerge. And uh, especially that is precisely why, uh, I mean, what really struck me is the concern of the transition, especially. Now, this brings to the fore another point. Maybe, in fact, you can address that in the very second round. Do we really need, when we are talking about just transition, right, uh, especially for the global south and, and the poorer nations, especially for the poorer nations of the global south, do we really need a separate classification of finance called transition finance? So you can maybe this might be the question for you in the second round, which you can check that up. But uh, for the timing, let me go to Esther. Uh, Esther, one thing is pretty clear out here that uh, uh, which Shubhal also mentioned that this is a heterogeneous space. I mean, with the uh, differential levels of growth, differential levels of aspirations, differential levels of commitments as well in terms of the net zero. Now, uh, there is, there's this uh, dual challenge of economic growth and climate action, especially, in fact, in the developing world and the global south. What do you think can be the uh, uh, the policy and the regulatory framework that can create a more enabling environment for uh, finance to flow in this part of the world? I'm keeping this question broad because we uh, have to face a host of uh, uh, Host of you know, you know the there there are there are concerns with the political institutions, negotiations, and and how do we promote cross border comparisons and transactions which can facilitate a just and equitable energy transition? So over to you, Mr. Thank you, Nilanjan. Um, good afternoon from Indonesia, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here and share my thoughts. I would really say appreciation to Shuva for really, you know, setting the context on the macro level uh, in the Pacific um, question that we're grappling with. If you will allow me, perhaps I will take on this question uh, mostly from a Southeast Asia perspective, um, as it is my focus. So in Southeast Asia, we have the ASEAN, right? ASEAN Green Taxonomy. And, and that's something that uh, we have continuously updated over the past few years. And this is something that we are proud of um, because, you know, uh, ASEAN as an institution that has often been cr criticized um, to not be together. Everyone is having their own, um, you know, playing uh, strategies. We, we at least have this. But at the actual implementation level, and if we're talking about cold hard truth realities that each ASEAN member state, each country have their own priorities. And it differs widely. You cannot compare Singapore to Indonesia, for example, nor can you compare the JETP or the Just Energy Energy Transition Package that Vietnam received with Indonesia because we are, we are on a completely different levels and situations. So the wake up call that um, I think I've been pondering with as I you know prepare to answer your question, Ilanjan, is for example, on Indonesia's perspective, what is the Indonesian government priority? And I had this conversation just very recently on a very, um, with a high level government official from our state utility PLN. I was talking about energy transition and decarbonization strategy and asking whether it's the financing challenge or, or what is what is really holding us back from you know, really accelerating um, our net zero ambition. And to be completely honest, what he told me was that at the end of the day, we're not really focusing on energy transition, right? We're still focusing on energy security because that's where we are as a country. And you cannot really mandate a country of 260 million people to focus on energy transition now without really thinking, how are we going to replace um the cheap energy source that we've been utilizing so far? Of course, it's fossil fuels. Um straight to renewable energy. So I think this is something that perhaps I'll I'll be very interested and curious to hear from Shufa on transition finance and transition technology later on. So that's number one, um, setting priorities. And this is inherently also linked, in my opinion, to how we communicate um, with private investors and how we can attract those private capital, right? What kind of market signals are we sending out to investors? Um, aside from the macro, aside from the micro risk uh, that, of course, we know are embedded in any project, whether it's a solar utility farm, whether it's um, you know a nuclear uh, power plant or things like that, the other big challenge that we have to address is the macro level risk or the country level risk, and this is um, of course the regulatory framework. And we know the drill. We know we, we've been saying this uh, for quite some time. You have to have strong institutions. You have to have 
good governance and then transparency, disclosure, so on and so forth. Uh, but I think there needs to be another consideration into thinking, okay, um, so how can we recalculate um, or reformulate the methodology um, to really understand what are the risks in emerging markets like Indonesia, like Vietnam, like Thailand? Uh, because right now, uh, the perception of risks in emerging markets are actually higher than the actual manifestation of those risks. And that is deterring investment greatly from the private sector side. Um but also what's contributing to that um, from my observation is, again, what, is the, what kind of signals are the, go- are the government of these countries sending um, to the market? And given the fact that they have not set their priorities yet, it's mixed signals, right? I'll give you an example. Um, in Indonesia, um, of course, since we chaired our G20 um, presidency a couple years ago, we received the JP $20 billion, amazing. And ever since then, it has been the talking point of our government to really scale up renewable energy and green energy. But when you actually look at the laws and regulations, we are about to pass a regulation that significantly lowers the renewable energy target that we had initially from 23% renewable energy mix um, in our power sector in 2025 down to 17%. And right now it's 2023 and we have only met 13% of it. So there's a huge question uh, on okay, on the one hand, you have this um, energy security that you have to understand, energy affordability, but on the other hand, the entire world is forcing you um, to transition away. And how do you combine these two together? It's, um, it's something that Indonesia is grappling with. Another example is Malaysia. We know that since 2021, if I'm not mistaken, Malaysia, uh, Malaysia Na- National Bank and many of the other major banks have committed to stopping you know, financing coal firepower plants. But just earlier this year, we heard that um, it's Exim Bank is in fact um, about to give a, a loan to a coal firepower plant in Vietnam. Now they've defended, they, but they say, you know, they're not giving those loans. They're just helping to raise um, money and funds for the project. But again, it's also sending mixed signals to the, to the market. There are a lot of other things on the financial engineering side that I'd be happy to go over uh, later down the line, perhaps in the second round, but I'll stop there for my first intervention. Thank you, Esther. Uh, interesting points, especially in fact, uh, the way uh, I presume uh, the per- you mentioned, uh, this has also been mentioned by Shuba as well, the perception of risks is higher than the actual risks in large parts of uh, of, uh, of your, your geography. Uh, now, uh, yeah, I, I presume that the trade-off that you have been talking of in terms of economic growth and climate action uh, is, is is pretty much clear, and and that is that is why, in fact, I uh, we go back to the same question again and again that uh, how do we get into this transition? So, do we really need a different kind of institutional mechanism, regulatory mechanism, or incentives? How do we create that incentive structure to move into this transition? So that incentive is going to be, uh, say, a finance from an ex- exogenous source, or is it going to be some fiscal measure by way of which we do this. Anyway, this 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 might be a question that you can take that up, in fact, in the second round. But uh, let me now come to Neha. Uh, Neha, of course, given your the kind of work that you are doing, the question uh, to you is quite natural, that uh, do we really have the right financial instruments in place to move to the desired direction? And, and is there is there some kind of a bottleneck that exists for the kind of financial innovation in this domain to move in the desired direction? Uh, thank you, Nilanjan, for the opportunity to be here. Um, and fantastic points raised by Shiva and Tamara. Um, and it is also an opportunity to step back a little and look at the big picture and then come to instruments. And I think all of us are doing it. And it's a very, very good thing to do. Otherwise, you talk amongst financial the finance people, they just directly go to, you know, oh, something has to be implemented and we don't have a framework. Okay. Um, I would like to, in my, you know, short remarks in the beginning, uh, touch upon some, you know, step back and touch upon some macro questions, which will, of course, finally come down to the question of instruments themselves. Um, and taking the cue from both uh, my previous speakers, uh, one part is, of course, you know, Nilanjit, you said, do we have instruments? I would ask ourselves, do we have the opportunity? 
and opportunity is there and i think that they i think that is universal consensus i think there is nobody saying that the opportunity is not there and why i say that is that uh the path towards greening of economies has begun i do not think that there is it is going to be reversed i think pace may be different uh you know uh, the the nature and texture of certain green economies may be different but countries are greening their economies and what do i mean by green economy and how this has been understood uh in literature by different institutions is that the growth in income and employment has to be uh you know propelled further by uh reduction in emissions reduction in pollution reduction in environmental costs on the one side uh to actually increasing in efficiencies of you know natural resource management energy efficiency etc while maintaining well being of the people so i think what is happening right now we talk about transition it is very uh technology focused we are not able to like nilanjan you asked you know that there seem to be different categories of just transition right and i think that's a fundamentally important question when we talk about uh transition energy transition we talk about you know renewable energies or we talk about decarbonization of industries and we pursue these objectives we mobilize finance through the use of the instruments which have become very specific to doing this kind of job right there are green bonds we should look at technologies now can we have a green plus plus approach and i think the time to uh, time has come to actually look at a little little bit more in an integrated way there are problems with that some may some, some people may argue because it introduces more complexity it, in, it introduces uh, you know the challenges of measurement green is pretty much straightforward you know you know what you're measuring people are comfortable with that financiers are comfortable with that and then and hence it has taken uh, that kind of uh, you know growth uh, path as well the second thing that uh, i would say that in the green economy i'm let it let me just focus a little bit on opportunity aspect that it is not only it, it's a, it's a global story you know it is happening in developed economies it is happening in developing countries uh, it is also producing something which can be a local uh, opportunity as well as an export opportunity so i think there is good amount of sense that in investing in green economy in uh, coming up with competitive uh, edge uh, because you can't be the one who, who would say that you know the rest of the actors whether they are institutions and regions which are going in a certain direction towards green and you know the 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 a very a uh, rigid binary between development transition and climate transitions and energy transitions i think doesn't serve the purpose even though it really puts the question at the center that will they be in conflict or will they actually be able to be pursued together and i think there is an opportunity to pursue them together if we have plans and strategies in place i think there is a lot which is happening within countries which is which, which i call excellent ideas but in small uh, aspects you know but even you you take the example of india right every successive budget has had more green elements in it so we are we are, we are doing things uh, you know our re industry re ramp up is really really fantastic and phenomenal uh, even though you know more more needs to be done uh, and yet we haven't really found ourselves uh, uh, sitting together uh and saying that no we need to implement some of the measures or we need to harness the success, success, successes that we are showing in different pockets through a sustainable finance roadmap for example now this budget talks about climate finance taxonomy great acknowledgement great first step you know uh but the work on it has actually happened in the last 3 years so it has taken us 3 years to actually say uh, acknowledge that we need it ASEAN has done a wonderful job we've been in, involved with ASEAN as well so yes so there is a question about having a systematic approach you may say that you know in countries like india there are far too many uh, compulsions 
uh, that we may not call that we have an India Green Deal program, but we are actually progressing towards that. After a certain point, one would have to say, because it all becomes a question of planning. If you do not have a strategy, if you do not have a plan, like Shuva said, you know, which sectors will become our sunrise sectors? Where do we have to actually push, uh, you know, those policy measures of employment, which are affiliated to green? That will need to be done by governments. And there is no other way that you can actually proceed that that policy signals, that government signals will have to be taken. In the Indo-Pacific context also, and just globally also, I wanted to also raise the question of debt sustainability. Uh, countries after the co after COVID experience are actually, you know, uh, uh, severely under debt stress. And there are many countries in the Indo-Pacific region also. Uh, and that you will have to say that, you know, you, after all, these instruments are instruments of borrowing. So you will add that borrowing to your, you know, a national account, and that question needs to be looked into, uh, looked in, looked also uh, particularly in a focused way. The third uh, thing is that mitigation is important, no doubt, or no doubt about it. But two third of Indo-Pacific region has coasts, and you know, you know, there, there, there is there is seas, and there is you know, large part of these countries have coastal um, uh, 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 coastlines, and resilience has to be has to be brought front and center to the to the conversations. Now let me talk a little bit about instruments. What is happening? Well, where the opportunity is large and where the real and perceived risks are actually have, have become a little bit low, you know, you are applying those instruments. Uh, $4.3 trillion globally is the universe of the thematic debt, which includes green bonds, ESG bonds, transition bonds, all of them together, social bonds, etc. Take the example of India, done exactly, almost mirrored the global uh, pathway in this. Our, our renewable energy sector, our transport sector, our companies with strong balance sheets have gone to offshore markets and raised nearly $46.1 billion of green bonds and other bonds. So why this is important? That more than half of this actually has been invested in by private uh, uh, companies. That is why it is important. These are instruments which have taken something very simple, offered a layer of transparency. Investors and issuers feel more comfortable. But then why isn't it growing? You know, why isn't it growing in relation to the space, the size of the Indian economy? There are Again, certain questions which are extraneous to greenness of it, but greenness itself becomes, becomes important. And that's why taxonomies become important because that becomes the benchmark of assessing whether your deal is credibly green or not. So when we talk to investors, they say, not only do you, do you give me a green bond, but please give me a credible green bond and I'm ready to invest. Okay. Now, all of these instruments are also going where the familiarity with, with risks is higher. So you, they go in mitigation. Uh, where is resilience uh, bonds uh, and things are happening? Very little. Who are acting? These are supranational development banks. These are multilateral development banks. These are EBRDs, World Banks, EIBs of this world who are getting into resilience. Do we have a resilience taxonomy or framework to identify these measures? Now, I because you know it's a very good. Uh, you know, uh, discussion forum, I would really like to share this with you, that cl uh, Climate Bonds is now releasing a resilience taxonomy, which is a global framework. Uh, and in September, we will do a soft launch also in India. And, uh, and then also, I would just, you know, would like us to think about it and probably in the second round, that when you talk about resilience, you should see it in a spectrum. When it is an opportunity, private capital will get interested. When it is only loss and damage, I mean, you're recovering from, you know, a loss, then it has to be granted. There has to be the public money, right? Uh, then uh, I would say that three more very short points. You talked about whether these are only external sources. I think it is really, really important. We have moved from a low interest rate environment now to an environment which is going to be, which is never going to come back to that negative interest rate, right? And that is also one cause why debt sustainability issues have arisen, just generally speaking. Now, in a high interest rate environment, 
a currency mismatch because most of these instruments are issued in hot currencies, USD and EUR. Okay, what do we do? We need to focus on domestic capital markets. We need to focus on domestic issuances. We need to focus on local currency issuances. I think we took this up and in, in, in as as an institution, we took this up in India. But I think this is an opportunity for Brazil. Brazilian presidency, as well as South African presidency, uh, to look at domestic uh, mobilization and creation of local green bond markets and thematic bond markets. I will end by saying another important actor would not only be multilateral development banks, probably the national development banks. There are five hundred of them in this world. The quantum that follows through national development banks is three times more than multilateral development banks when it comes to mitigation and slightly less on adaptation so we and they are they are closer to understanding your risks they can price risks better they can be conduits of international concessional finance better and it is not only at the top end that you will look at it every country has cities states provinces these are the these are the banks which would become the conduits of actually making the finance flow where it is required mm-hmm. so i will just close it uh, at this point and take other questions and responses in the next round thank you thank you neha a host of points of course and uh, including uh, i presume resilience taxonomy is going to be extremely interesting something that we really look forward to and uh, thanks for putting across uh, uh, the fact that we need a multi layered approach uh when it comes to the domestic financing as well uh, uh well we come we will come to the second round of course with you and uh, there are a host of questions that uh, your uh, first round of presentation has already given rise to but let me now come to kedar kedar in fact uh, you are the person from the mdb and uh, given the fact that uh, we have been talking in terms of say the center size of 4.3 3 trillion or whatever all these numbers what is it that mdbs are looking at we know that mdbs all the banks are looking at roi the return on investment purely and this roi essentially happens to be what we call an economic rate of return but there might be projects which which might not yield you that uh, whatever your desired economic rate of return or the desired roi but at the same time what you find is that there is a very high social rate of return now being a, from a development financial institution are you really going to figure that or or uh, put that in the equation that is one and second is that you of course have uh, perceived risks so what do you do in fact under circumstances where the social rate of return is high along with the perceived risk so possibly this is also going to be something like a social ethical question and 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 of course a positive question which is going to affect your bottom lines so what do you get that yes uh, thank you very much uh, dr ghosh and overf team for giving me the opportunity to speak with the uh, distinguished speakers over here and i have uh, taken the note of the uh, few conclusions that has been uh, drawn from the uh, discussion that we had so far uh, regarding the uh, the one from the shua regarding the uh, south uh, globe of the Uh, countries uh, where the countries are uh, in the heterogeneous nature and the risk is risk profiling and the perceived risk are different also and the technological measures have been uh, with respect to the their resources are diverse and are lo- uh, local specific uh, local uh, uh, domain specific also uh, then from the history also i have taken into consideration about uh, her intervention with respect to the great success of the uh, asian technology and how the perceived risk are still kind of uh, the barrier to be uh, overcome for the mdbs and the bilaterals to working upon and to mobilize the flow of uh, uh, money uh, rapidly uh, in terms of solving the problem of the energy transitions uh, also i have seen that multilateralism has been a defragmented de- approach so far even if have, we have the multilateral multiple multilateral forums uh, e- existing right now but to uh, to land up on and to have the concrete integrated approach we shall take it into consideration from the all the policy trade energy uh, also capacity building point of view uh, then the from the nihat's point of view i have understood like uh, how we have to go f- 
beyond the green approach where we have to adopt the green plus plus approach uh, in the more integrated uh, way and uh, having the benefits uh, with respect to the local econo economy uh, evolution as well as the competitive economy in terms of the having the export base uh, base uh, opportunities to be available to the local uh, communities that will also shut be taken into consideration and the soft uh, uh, launching of the resilience bond that will happen in September. So that all the interventions has been very much uh, uh, fruitful and have been uh, very helpful to better understand the whole uh, sphere of the climate taxonomy as well as the developmental finance in this uh, uh, context. So coming back to the question that you have asked, Mr. Dr. Ghosh, uh, as uh, the French Development Agency is a public development bank of the government of France and our uh, aim is to implement OECD's official development aid in the global south. So it has been like a four percent of the global, uh, the four uh, percent of the French uh, GDP that we have been investing so far in the multiple sectors, uh, largely into uh, energy. Uh, sustainable de uh, sustainable transport, urban development, uh, water and sanitation, biodiversity, uh, which will come, will come under the ethos of the uh, preservation, conservation of the natural resources. Uh, so uh, right now, like uh, most of the uh, interventions we have in Africa, like most out of uh, 12 billion of the lending that we have done last year, 50% of the lendings are happening in the soft form or the grant form in the Africa and other rest of the regions in the emerging economy. We are providing consistent financing and uh, uh, the technical assistance uh, in order to support the ecological as well as energy transition altogether. Uh, so just coming back on the question that you asked, we are the bilateral institution, not a multilateral one, uh, but the role uh, in fact will be the similar in order to uh, bring the traction in the integrated approach along with the multilateral development banks and we could be the starting point uh, to uh, initiate these kind of actions through the multiple interventions that we, we can do. So the energy transition uh, in the uh, small island developing countries and the LDCs uh, will be extremely challenging. As we know, they have to leapfrog from the fossil fuels to the renewable energy. In the context of the bilaterals or multilaterals or PDBs, uh, we have to undertake the new projects which are having the higher risk in terms of the technology as well as, as the, the credit risk will be higher uh, and where the capital cost as well as the low returns will be considered uh, while uh, developing and uh, while providing the loans uh, to these projects particularly and we have to consider in the business model the intangible benefits uh, the intangible uh, output, socio-economical enhancement into the business model altogether to have the integrated approach and to uh, reduce uh, the perceived risk into the uh, while uh, supporting these projects. That is one of the thing. No other banks will, other commercial banks will do it. We are developmental bank and we are not the one who are going to compete with the commercial bank. So this is our role to consider uh, the social di di uh, social uh, dividend into the business model and uh, to work accordingly and to provide the consistent financing. So uh, when it, I'm saying, uh, I will a little bit inclined towards uh, the new technological interventions happening in the energy transition, uh, which will focus on the solar battery storage or the solar PV floating project, solar wind hybrid projects, which can provide 24 by 7 uh, round the clock renewable energy supply, as well as the firm dispatchable renewable energy. That is much more important right now uh, because to uh, match with the peak load demand, which has been increasing in the country like India and Vietnam. But when it comes to the LDCs and uh, uh, SIDs, maybe this will be the second step to be considered because energy transition is altogether the ball game of the systematic approach. So we can also consider the plain vanilla projects uh, starting from the low hanging fruit and going further for the other battery storage technologies. Uh, but in this case, from the multi, uh, multilateral or bilateral instru uh, bilateral development banks perspectives, I think uh, aggregation of the demand and the second thing, congregation of the similar stakeholders in the region is very important. So regional entity uh, creation, uh, which will be uh, aggregating the demand and the producing the pipeline of the projects for the small 
uh, island developing countries or the least developed uh, countries is very much essential uh, when it comes to the financing uh, from the multilaterals and bilaterals. And one of the in, uh, important things of the energy transition in these countries will be focusing on uh, distributed generation with the battery storage solutions. So this is much more important. And where the public development banks or the bilaterals like AFD can provide the partial risk guarantee mechanism in order to reduce uh, the, the off-taker risk that has been uh, uh, looked at as one of the perceived risks in this uh, sector when it comes to the project financing. So this also the distributed production or support to the distributed uh, solar generation along with the storage or without the storage uh, plays an important role in the energy transition policy of the AFD, which is focused on the decentralized decarbonize and uh, digitalize approach. So three Ds that has been very much important for the AFD. And along with that, like, of course, I'm quite sure that it aligns with other uh, multilaterals uh, or development banks, uh, energy transition policies also. So we are not doing something different. We have to have the, the common, common approach, integrated approach, just to have uh, the one uh, solution or the one uh, mandate in the mind when we are addressing the energy transition issues right now in the uh, countries like uh, small island developing nations as well as the least developed countries. The second point that is coming into the mind, uh, the multilaterals, bilaterals, they should be involved more in the policy-based loans where they literally uh, adopting the states, adopting the nations, right from the starting of the policy framework, regulatory framework, articulation, uh, from the, and then through the policy planning, uh, then strategic framework, as well as then going to the uh, project preparation facilities and the capacity building, and then financing is provided uh, in terms of the concessionality by these uh, uh, bilateral development institutions, multilateral development banks uh, for the on-ground implementations. So this is very much important and of also right from the policy base uh, approach, the multilaterals, bilaterals should also help guide these nations, these uh, least developed countries, uh, governments to have uh, to have in place the uh, payment security mechanism that we have uh, uh, have witnessed in the India through the SICI and other kind of modalities like uh, policy-based security, uh, policy-based in incentive, uh, for example, uh, that we have witnessed in the India right from the starting uh, of the renewable energy growth uh, uh, journey, uh, which was the uh, viability gap funding uh, feed-in tariff. Uh, this kind of instruments has to be occur, has to be initiated by the government. So multilateral, bilateral has to uh, help, guide, advise the governments to effectuate this kind of uh, this kind of uh, initiative, this kind of policy based incentive uh, mechanisms, along with the uh, payment security mechanism, as well as providing the uh, the partial risk guarantee mechanisms when it comes to the project financing. Uh, and this is technical assistance that is another uh, uh, in, in, in the next one minute can you just conclude and summarize uh, yeah. sorry for taking the long and uh, for technical assistance uh, uh, point of view the we are uh, positioned to provide technical uh, assistance uh, for the uh, project uh, project based uh, uh, financing as well as to enhance enable uh, the institutional capacities of the implementing agent agencies to better understand the taxonomy as well as to appraise the projects uh, and uh, enabling them to uh, 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 enable the, uh, enable them to uh, understand the physical climatic climate risk also the uh, when it is coming coming to the uh, the line of credits to the public development banks uh, to better understand the risk associated with their portfolios. That is also very important. And uh, uh, the energy modeling, uh, uh, this mod energy modeling and to quantify the climate uh, risk, uh, climate change risk on the macroeconomical aspects, on the economics, that can be found out through the multiple tools that has been uh, generated by the uh, multilateral development banks and AFD has a tool called James to quantify this monitoring and financing uh, risks associated with the ecological transition. So the MDBs and the uh, multilateral, uh, the bilaterals have the multiple roles to play right from right starting from the beginning. And also, I feel like uh, the we are lacking in the financial uh, uh, 
innovations, financial mechanism innovations, uh, where a lot of lot can be done uh, in terms of greening the financial systems and also the philanthropic uh, funding can be associated, can be coupled with our concessional financing to make more uh, consistentiality of the financing to be absorbed and uh, to lower uh, the perceived risk also and to uh, achieve the economy of the scale. So I will stop over here and Thank sorry you. for taking the yes, that's, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for uh, pointing out the kind of work that uh, DFIs as a whole, I think that will be the right term to be used rather than classifying you as an MDB. So DFIs are doing. Of course, you place the DFI perspective uh, pretty succinctly. Uh, there will be a question later on because I'm more interested in knowing that, you know, that in the last uh, G20 India Leaders Summit, there was this declaration of the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. And in fact, there are plans to develop the renewable energy and the green hydrogen corridor out there as well, the hub, green hydrogen hub. So whether AFD will be interested in investing in this and what might be the other agencies who might get interested in getting into uh, this kind of a framework, what do you think are the perceived risks as well in such investments? But, well, that, that remains a separate question, but let me come to uh, Giovanni Maurice Pradipta, who uh, so, Giovanni, what do you think about the civil society organizations in the Indo-Pacific? How can they accelerate energy transition by influencing the policy making uh, and, and, and shaping the public opinion? That is, that is one question to you. Uh, and and uh, what is more important is that uh, do you have any cases, do we have any replicable cases, in fact, in which can be replicated in other parts? where such a such a voice can be created, such public opinions can be created, so that uh, this can uh, lead to uh, that, that kind of a framework of moving to uh, uh, to renewables. Thank you, uh, Nilanjan, and all uh, the other speakers for the, uh, for me, <laughs> very uh, technical points uh, on energy transition. I think, uh, I will come uh, in a very different angle uh, as um, um, myself, uh, I'm working more on the dialogues within uh, the civil society organizations between Germany and Indonesia, uh, as my role stated. Um, one of the first thing, though, before I, I answering uh, how is like, what is the condition actually in the civil society organizations in the Indo-Pacific region, right? Um, I am myself working more with the ASEAN region and Indonesia, so maybe some of my perspective also comes from there. But yeah, first point is that civil organizations uh, are seen to be like one, but the problem is it's not. Uh, and not just that, a, more, uh, a lot of civil organizations everywhere are still learning what is actually the connection between climate, between energy transition, uh, and then uh, what is the connection between that and civil movement and human rights? Because mostly civil organizations usually are coming from that point, right? They are usually fighting for democracy. They are usually fighting for um, uh, social economic rights and so on. And suddenly you are being asked, what is actually energy transition? And that comes to my second point. Um, and borrowing what Neha already said before, we are already at the beginning at the precipice of greening economy right but in reality people probably uh, a lot of people in indo-pacific regions in dialogues that i have been in are asking why why actually we are going there the transition is most of the time are outside the scope of the civil organizations themselves and the people that are actually inside the transition uh, we can see in the in the discussion itself, we are already talking about loans. We are already talking about multiple kinds of technologies and so on. And I I myself in a lot of this discussion uh, is often hearing about that. But a lot of um, in in reality, a lot of people in Indo Pacific regions are cooking with uh, firewood. In in reality, most of us don't have electricity. Or, well, yes, but then not 24 hours. And 
And then suddenly now people are asking, we are changing to the, uh, another technology to provide you electricity. And people are like, yeah, okay, whatever. And it is often so that the discussion are so far out of reach of the people that the people themselves that we actually need in the transition because energy transition are, uh, how do you call this? We have to make it as decentralized as possible because of the nature of renewable energy. But at the same time, uh, in, in the Pacific regions, a lot of question about energy is often very centralized. I mean, in Southeast Asia, the, the names that I know, PLN, uh, EVN from Vietnam, Tenaga Nasional from Malaysia are state-owned, centralized companies that provide energy for everyone. And then we are now suddenly coming to uh, well, not just poor people, but middle class people and saying, hey, you have to install photovoltaics on your roof because we need you. And people are asking why. Why do we have to spend such money for that? And uh, the communication between us, between the civil society organization, between civil society organization and the people, between um, the governments and the people that are actually doing the transition happens. Uh, flown well, uh, essentially. And because it's such a diverse re region, we have been talking about that uh, multiple times in this in this in this forum. Um, there, there are just uh, such a gap between the countries. Some countries are needing climate adaptation rather than mitigation. Some countries are more needing energy security rather than the question of, yeah. Uh, solar panel technologies and stuff like this. Uh, we are, well, I don't want to say forced, but we are <laughs> forced suddenly to be, uh, to talk about uh, these kind of things because most of us, most of our governments ratify Paris Agreement. And it is not that it is bad, no, but uh, at uh, at the level of things, there are still civil society organizations in Indonesia that actually fight for coal power just because coal power actually give and feed the people that they are uh, that it is around in their cities. So they are really asking if that it's gone, how can we eat? Right? Yeah. Um, so, okay, what is needed? <laughs> Um, the step we are already doing here, conversation and coordination, right? Uh, if we want to make the movement thorough and inclusive, we have to invest time and resources early in the beginning. I wish actually to see more of the, well, MDB funding, JET, uh, JETP funding and so on also flow into this kind of I will say soft uh, um, parts of the transition rather than the technology itself, because if we see in uh, state of the art researchers that we have now, when we see how much money that we that Indonesia, for example, just uh, as an example, need for the transition, the calculation is all about how um, phase the, phase out coal, phase in renewable energy, and the technology inside. But there are no cal economic calculation yet what is actually needed for the transition to happen for the people, not for the technology. I, I, if you guys have, please, I, I, do, I do need that information um, because it is difficult to talk to people um, that will lose their job because of that. <laughs> and and, and uh, they cannot see what is the benefit of this whole uh, discussion, right? Uh, and second, um, continuity. One of the <laughs> one of the most problems that we have as civil society organizations also is that we have the idea, we have the project time, but then after the project time ends. But mostly, uh, we we know that uh, climate problems, energy transition problem, is a continuous problem that we have to have. And most of the project time is what? One, two years, six months even. And then after that, uh, somebody else will probably do the same thing 
and there is no coordination between us. And that is severely needed uh, as we are accelerating towards that point. Maybe one last example, um, like I, I, it is very difficult to measure uh, how dialogues can be successful. But one of, one of the things that at least I have been involved in it was in the very early days of Just Energy Transition Partnerships, when we, it just was announced. Um, German Watch helped some Indonesian organizations um, to have the dialogue uh, of, how do you call this, to set up principles for what does it mean to go to just energy transition, right? Um, and the dialogue, uh, the people that is was inside the dialogue was first only five organizations, then the next meeting it grows to 60, <laughs> includes uh, uh, other CSOs, um, Indonesian, um, the, the Indonesian Bank, Bank Indonesia, the National uh, Bank of Indonesia. It included uh, people from the Indonesian ministries that actually also work on oil and gas because they want to see our perspective and so on. And well, I felt at least there, uh, people agreed that uh, before talking about just energy transition, we need to talk what is just. And what does in energy transition mean for Indonesia? So at least uh, I feel that from that two, three, four dialogues that uh, people have something to bring home and uh, to analyze. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think extremely thought provoking. And and in, in fact, this brings us back to the very first question that I put across to Shubha after her deliberation. That is, in fact, uh, uh, what you mentioned was, can, uh, is, is tantamount to uh, the social cost of transition. Who is going to pay for that? So, uh, so now, now I'd request each of the uh, each of each of the presenters to confine their second round uh, of deliberation to two to three minutes. So, Shubha, the question is already laid in front of you. So, how do we essentially account for and uh, the social cost of transition, and who bears that cost? I'm happy we have come back to the original point. Um, also, there's a question in the chat. I'll take a moment to address that also at the end of this, that how, yeah. how do you group but this within, country? Within two to three minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, to address the social cost, I mean, there's a word that uh, Kedar used, which was leapfrog, which is that, you know, uh, countries don't go in the same linear pathway to economic or uh, energy transition. So you will have to see what countries leapfrogging to what especially now in the modern era, because uh, the options are many full versus the industrial era where you had only leap from coal to gas to oil and so on and so forth. So a um, couple of examples I wanna give uh, to Giovanni's point on how do you really integrate people into this? Two things that India did, one is called the Ujwala Yojana, which is the uh, which is a transition from burning biomass and cow dung and so on and so forth to the LPG cylinder connection. And we gave this to 100 million women beneficiaries over four or five years. And the point is, this thing is an energy transition project, but it was not billed as an energy transition project. The reason India did it, and it was part of the national budget, it was not an MDB fancy project, etc., was that one, women were uh, suffering from the health because we, they were burning this coal and biomass in very small houses. Their families were in there. There's a huge cost. There was a time cost to this uh, because of collecting all this biomass and stuff. Uh, there was a productivity loss because the whole day they were doing all of these things. And also a decision that was taken was to give it to the women of these BPL households, the below poverty line households, because we wanted to bring women into the mainstream where they were also part of decision making of the energy choices that did. At no point was this really built as energy transition in the traditional sense of financing it. Another similar thing that we had done was PM Kusum was the agri pump, solar agri pumps. Again, that went to went from diesel generated water pumps to solar based pumps 
farms, but and this was for around 250,000 farmers. The Ujwala Yojana was for 100 million household uh, women, so you can imagine 400 million uh, actual beneficiaries if we take four people and families more than that usually. But even for the solar agri pumps, the reasons that we did it was not energy transition. It was to reduce the load on the grid because agricultural uh, pumps, uh, electricity is free for us. So it's, it was something that was burdening industry to cross subsidize that. There was also um, overdrawing of water because the diesel pumps used to not be switched off or the electricity fed pumps were not switched off. So time of day metering allowed us to reduce the water consumption. And the third thing was a government promise that they had done to increase farmer incomes. And so net metering became one of the sources for that. So again, this is how society is drawn into a transition uh, from entrenched practices over that have happened over millennia to newer things without being billed as something transitional. And now to answer a little bit of question on how do you group countries having a leapfrog. So if you go to see something like a Nicaragua in um, the Central America and Kenya in Africa are having a similar energy transition where they've gone from having very limited energy sources to being almost entirely renewable energy powered. Or if you take India and China going from coal towards renewables, you take Egypt and Argentina, let's say again in two different continents, they're going from gas towards renewables. Brazil is going from hydro and biomass they're checking. So where well, the current study that we are doing is actually looking at 40, 45 countries on different continents, different requirements, but doing similar transitions that cannot be grouped geographically or politically, but they can be grouped on behavior of where they are. And finally, I want to close with the question is that we really want to ask, what are we financing, first of all? And so is it just projects? Because we look at financing in the sense that when a society transforms, you have to look at the consumption of the sustainable goods and services that you're financing. We have to look at the investments in the businesses that are being impacted beyond the solar project or the wind project. We need to look at the government spending, like Ujwala and Kusum were both government spending, their taxpayer money, they're not MDB money. And finally, we also need to look at the trading of these goods and services that are sustainability related, so on and so forth. Where is digitalization coming in, which is very, very important in our developing countries because it helps our leapfrog and finally just the last absolute last point because this was made on energy security versus energy transition social security versus transition india for example started with solar and biomass in the 70s that was against the oil shocks it was not a climate related conversation that we had we spend more than 100 billion dollars a year on just importing oil and gas we would like to go to solar if we can because we have lots of it does it apply to an indonesia or a bangladesh no because they have different energy security considerations. So my point over here is that there are several things happening. I completely take the point on where are the people, and this is a reason why um, non-financial people need to be a part of this because they bring in that perspective of who are we doing this transition for? Why are we doing this? What are we financing? Who's benefiting? Who's losing out on this conversation? including countries, not just individual people. So uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. I think it was a very, very nice broad-based conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shubha. Uh, co covered uh, large numbers of points. So, uh, Esther, let me come to you. In fact, you talked about energy security vis-a-vis -vis energy transition, so brought about the social dimension, and eventually uh, mm -hmm. that, that is one of the crucial things that we have been discussing so far. Uh, and and that is what essentially is going to differentiate on the uh, between the priorities of the global north and the global south. So out here, when we talk about Indo-Pacific, we are essentially a combination of the global north and the global south nations. Now out here, so 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 to bring about this entire concern of of uh, say just transition, what should be the pathways? A and and how right. do we essentially and who who is going to bear that cost? Right. Thanks, Nilanjan, for that. Um, I think as I listen to my other fellow panelists speak um, and give their point, a lot of the questions that I've been pondering at 
comes down to just one word, which is partnerships, right? You can't really, you really cannot do this alone. Earlier, Giovanni mentioned um, a very specific point that talks, you know, that speaks to me, which is coordination. Like people are not talking to one another. The civil society is not talking to the government. The government is not really talking with the private sector. Private sector sometimes don't talk to MDBs. And I think that this is, this is really key because when you look at the grand scheme of things, if you look at clean energy transition, in emerging markets, you know, 50% of the financing comes from public money. And this is compared to advanced economies where only 20% of it comes from public financing, including DFIs, right? So the key to really finance the energy transition is really scaling up the private financing, which means that the DFI money and then the public uh, public financing money really need to be more efficient in raising the private um the private capital. And so far the the record has been poor. If I recall correctly, I think MDBs mobilized only, what, $20, $20 billion uh, in private finance compared to their actual climate loan, which is about $65, 68 billion in 2022. And we cannot sustain this um, formal financing any longer. Eventually, at the end of the day, these MDBs also have um, cash limitations, right? So how do we make sure that uh, the financing moving forward for emerging markets can stand on its own and it can be sustainable in the long run and, you know, just really bring them on their own feet? Um, so I come to three points here. Um, first, uh, this has been alluded to many times before, reduce uh, you know, the macro risk. Um, and I won't go further any more than that. But number two, just really rethinking about innovative way that we can partner with philanthropic uh, organizations as well, right? Um, you know, there are a lot of challenges, especially in emerging markets like Southeast Asia, where bankable projects, there are just not a lot of bankable projects. There are projects that are, you know, they are in the margin of being commercially uh, viable or they're in the, uh, they're, they just need an additional, a little more uh, for us to take it further. And this is where, in my opinion, philanthropic organizations can really step in. And we're seeing this happening in real life. Of course, these are small scale and we need to scale it up, but it is happening. For example, uh, ADB um, has launched the Allied Climate Partners, not under the ADB umbrella, but um, its CEO uh, did that $1 billion um, to be um, you know, deployed across Southeast Asia, India, um, and Latin America. Um, and number two, also, um, really coming back to the point earlier that I mentioned that emerging market governments, including my own government, so this is a critic to my own government, need to talk to capital allocators more. You need to really um, knock on the doors of the BlackRock, for example. Um, and I say this because um, there are actually things happening in the private um, investor realm. And one of the biggest hurdles that they face is that they just really don't understand of emerging economies. They don't understand developing economies uh, that well. It's the MDBs and it's the DFIs that have been operating locally in these countries uh, for far longer than they they have, right? BlackRock has, uh, you know, has primarily invested only in OECD countries, not in Indonesia, not a lot in Vietnam, not a lot in Thailand. So there, that need, there needs to be that conversation, that connection. Um, so one example of that is uh, the climate partnerships uh, vehicle that uh, BlackRock has, um, has deployed. That's $11 billion invested in emerging economies, including Southeast Asia. Given the fact that uh, by the end of 2022, the net private wealth of the world stood at 454 trillion US dollar and this is slated to increase to 627 trillion US dollar by by 2027 so given this can't we actually mobilize 1% of this wealth uh, essentially to meet the 4.3 trillion gap i mean what kind of in instruments can we ex essentially have to bridge this gap to to mobilize that fund here yeah uh, thanks, Nandanjan, for the question, but I'm so tempted to also reflect on what other speakers have said. So maybe I will focus on your, uh, focusing on answering your question first, and then do give me some time to uh, uh, actually look at uh, what Giovanni uh, also mentioned and what Shua also mentioned. Um, so yes, I mean, if you wanted to talk about can this be mobilized and why is it not getting mobilized? Are there structures or are there instruments like that? So yes, there are instruments. And you know what we generally talk about in the broad category of blended finance. You blend capital, you de-risk investments, 
and you then make it attractive for private capital right so um, so yes there are structures uh, like blended finance and it is now almost become a push amongst policy makers as well as believe me you amongst central bankers to tell financial institutions to start looking at blended finance solutions to be able to fund climate technologies and people centric new kind of you know projects uh, because it is clear that a large swath of these technologies and projects do not have the risk a favorable risk adjusted return profile so you will require money that can come in as grant that can come in at a certain concessional rate to be able to de-risk this investments can philanthropies in this world be you know can move i think more and more philanthropies and a lot of them are actually are also our funders right the funders in the civil society space which are working on these things and they are really looking at if they put in their 1 how can that be leveraged to produce a thousand so even philanthropies are trying to do that thinking i would not say that we have advanced a lot but if you look at some of these deals the low, the total volume of such blended finance deals that right now uh, globally stands at around 2 231 billion dollars okay this is a report that converges does and they are this is i'm i'm putting the figure from there but what is the challenge in these deals is it takes a longer period of time to bring bring uh, the governance of these partners together you know in a manner that everybody understands and the outcome of these deals in terms of the volume is still lower so i think we have to go into a version 2.0 where uh, even mgps not only the philanthropies where the, the the risk appetite within this concessional bucket or the grant bucket is actually tested further because i think that is the litmus test there has to be more done on part of that i will close by actually uh, reflecting and addressing some of the amazing points that were made by other panelists the people centricity centricity of this transition is absolutely the central question without that the transition itself will be fragile i have seen that i have i was a non financial risk advisor for the earlier part of my career i have gone to these large investments you everybody would remember and probably can relate to large development projects whether they were thermal plants whether they are oil and gas they all at some point in time faced the conundrum of whether they have the social license to operate or not so it is basically the old wine in a new bottle with climate added to it if we do not address those people questions we will not be able to actually transition into a new structure of economy and i think that can also be made measurable we take a lazy approach and we say oh social aspects are so difficult to measure no mm. if you actually come down to it you can assess how will you make a substantial contribution to job creation count how will you make access to goods and services uh, uh, you know measurable how will you make local community empowerment measurable all of these things are possible we attempted that in india with ministry of finance in the previous sort of work that we did on taxonomy unless that becomes and that is very context specific understood okay. but that can be done so i will just stop yeah so kedar over to you the imic question uh yes thank you uh, mr ghosh uh, if you allow me just i will spend a one minute uh, on the some of the things that i have spoken before and i would like to uh, speak it before uh, so as i said like a, we being a bilateral development institute uh, working uh, in the global south uh, and investing uh, 0.4% of the french gdp as a oda uh and i spoke about it like a 4% that was my mistake so has to be corrected so it will range around between 0.35 to 0.4% of the gdp that has been utilized by the afd as a oda and uh, uh, which comes out to be around 12 billion euros that we have spent in the terms of concessional loans grants all together with other financing modalities all over the world for fostering the sustainable uh energy and ecological transitions uh second thing that is coming into the my mind like it's a 4 trillion the figure we have been listening we have been hearing 
it. So absolutely, it will not be uh, in terms of the total amount absolute value that will be contributed by the MDBs or, uh, or by the bilaterals altogether that we know the limitations. But four trillion, uh, for mobilizing the four trillion, the MDBs and the bilaterals or PDBs will be creating the ripple effect in the market. So the crowding in the private investment uh, so that this reach, this figure of 4 trillion will be reached for the uh, developing countries uh, in order to have the clean energy setups by 2030. Uh, also, uh, the question, there was a uh, discussion by the Easter with respect to the uh, uh, how come like uh, all the institute, multilaterals, bilaterals come together on the, uh, one platform? So I would like to uh, mention about the IDFC group, which was uh, uh, led and uh, uh, which was spearheaded by the AFD, which is a network of 27 national, regional and bilateral institutions, uh, which has in total 4 trillion uh, in the assets and uh, more than 600 billion uh, the financing has been mobilized out of which 150 billion was for the climate so as we can see like the climate portion climate financing out of total financing by the mdbs and uh, uh, bilaterals has to be increased in order to have more share or more, more emphasis on the climate co-benefits uh, factor when it comes to the financing in the South Asia. So altogether, these were the, the three things that I wanted to add. And coming to the question of the Indo-Middle uh, East corridor uh, that you have mentioned, uh, unfortunately, we are not working in the Middle East except the country in the, uh, Egypt because we are intended to work, our mandate is to work in the underdeveloped or emerging countries. So Middle East, that part is not taken into consideration, but under ISA, which has been uh, co-sponsored or the co-founded uh, by the India and France, there were some studies undergoing by the ISA with the help of the French utility EDF uh, on the Indo-Middle East corridor, which will be enabling the energy trade between the two regions and uh, uh, benefiting uh, the, the time gap in between and the how to, uh, ma uh, in order to match the peak load demand by the renewables. But I don't have the details with respect to it because it has been uh, discussed uh, throughout uh, since last one and a half years. But in the next uh, General Assembly of the ISA, we will have the more updates. But for the, however, uh, every technical arm, up because I have to go to yeah. Germany. Yeah. So if this uh, technical arm expertise, France has been contemplating to have the assignment on the cross-border electricity trade in the BBI, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and India, and Nepal region. Uh, and it has to be started from the next one. But uh, considering the, all the uncertainties and the disruptions in the Bangladesh, right now we have to uh, reorient our strategy. And maybe Sri Lanka will be part of it. Uh, but uh, the next year we will have a detailed studies because we have to bring in a lot of value addition to this, uh, to this through this assignment because uh, USAID, ADB, World Bank, and the other stakeholders mm -hmm. have already been working. But then again, uh, there has been a facturation between the Southeast Asia and South Asia, so that has to be coupled somewhere. So oh, we have to take great. in consideration. Thank, Fine. You, Thank you. Thank you. So, Giovanni, two minutes uh, for you. Your last words. Last words for this particular uh, webinar. Uh, yeah. Um, I Maybe two points. And uh, the first one, I will agree with Nia's uh, uh, point. Uh, like the social uh, and economically soft stuff are not difficult. The measurement is not difficult. It's just not being done somehow. Maybe left in the discussion. Maybe I don't know. But... Maybe it is also a way uh, to address uh, Esther's uh, like point before. Maybe it is also a way to alleviate the feeling of risk that is there. Because uh, mostly the problem is also that uh, I feel that people probably are also do not understand what they are paying to. And um, by having a better measurement, we we already uh, have often um, that in the numbers of gigawatts that we need to invest, but maybe also when we have when we know how much people impacted and uh, how they are impacted, maybe that is also a way to invite more investment towards the 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 uh, whole the energy transition anyway. Um, but my second point is about 
uh, breaking the bubble in the sense that but here what I mean is uh, in our discussion, uh, all the panelists here understands what each other are saying, right? But again, <laughs> when we talk with other people that is outside, they they probably don't understand what we are talking about but on the other hand maybe we can learn from their experiences on how to implement uh, on how to implement uh some societal changes that we need uh one of the examples that maybe uh is 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 uh, better is that how do you call it like positive is uh how sometimes in the world of uh raising money about crowdfunding we have to trust the people that actually if there are positive stuff that can go on it can people will put money into it uh, in one way or another uh, indonesia has been doing this with what is it's called uh, correct me if i'm wrong uh, as the green sukuk if i'm not mistaken it has uh, last year. It has uh, like since two thousand nineteen. It raised what like one point four billion US dollar or something, and at least it says that it promises that the money that is raised from this from the people that people can also put money into it will go to uh, green and climate financing projects. Which mm -hmm. means that it is people is also the solution to the financing problem itself, right? Um, yeah, but okay. we need to appeal to them that it is it does make sense. Maybe that. Thank you. Perfect. I think uh, I mean we had a plethora of ideas. I mean this has been a, a fabulously rich discussion. Uh, out of which, in fact, there are a host of takeaways, and it's very very difficult for me at this point in time to conclude them because there is only one minute left. But uh, all all I'd like to state here is that that. Uh, this is a complex problem, undoubtedly. Uh, when we talk about transition, of course, and, and Indo-Pacific by itself, which has been the term came again and again that it's it's a heterogeneous geography, heterogeneous space with with the varying levels of development, varying levels of ambitions, varying ambitions, varying cultures. So out here, when we talk about transition, how do we put that to effect? Given the fact that there is the coexistence of the global north and the global south in this part of the world, is it that uh, we are only going to talk about, first of all, mitigation? That's the question. Because Giovanni mentioned that some, for some, in fact, adaptation is a bigger priority than mitigation. It's a fact that large parts of the global south need to adapt. In fact, uh, let's let's take the net zero uh, targets for the various nations. For India, it's 2070. For China, it's 2060. For uh, uh, US, it's 2050. Now, given this, in any case, the vulnerable regions need to survive till 2040, 2050, or 2060 because net zero is only going to be the beginning. So we have to get into this transition mode, but this transition will also need that financing because we have to survive and we have to transition by all means need to have adaptation financing built into it because let's take this. Out here, I stay in the city of Kolkata and in fact, uh, within a few kilometers out here, there is this uh, extensive delta region called the Sundarbans, which is largely sinking. And, and out there, in fact, uh, uh, I have to remove the population. We need to think of a mode of adaptation like strategic retreat. Despite the fact that I talk about energy transition, I talk about mitigation, the impacts are going to come maybe 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years hence. But by that time, that island will be gone. So given this, we have to think of the financing mode or this uh, entire mechanism uh, through a much more integrated and holistic lens. It has to be the climate action and resilience financing and adaptation financing built into it. And only then we can talk about just transition and transition financing. So thank you. Thank you, panel, in fact, for bringing out uh, a host of issues, a host of concerns and a host of options and opportunities as well. Uh, I presume that uh, we have a rich base of knowledge which has been created out of this discussion. And uh, thanks to all five of you for uh, talking from your experience, your knowledge, 
and and uh, I presume that uh, this is going to be a rich depository, rich uh, repository of of uh, of uh, knowledge, information, and opportunities for the posterior and opens up op options uh, in terms of uh, transition financing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.